Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Astronomy Month, the 13th edition. Can't believe this. I'm your host, Andrew Fazakis, the night sky guy here for Astronomers Without Borders. Welcome wherever you're watching from around the world. Yes, this is the start of, Astro uh, of, of Global Astronomy Month. It is the world's largest celebration of astronomy where we are in over 140 countries around the world and tens of thousands of people around the world are, are creating, conducting events, looking at the night sky, celebrating our shared heritage of the cosmos. And we have a lot of really amazing things lined up for this month. I don't know if you've had a chance to look through our schedule that we have online. Let me just share here with you. If you haven't had a chance, this is where everything is listed that is happening uh, officially with Global Astronomy Month. And if you are part of an astronomy club or a library or an individual, regardless, if you are doing an astronomically related event during the month of April, it's really amazing to be able to share that with the world. And you get that chance if you submit and register your event for free on our official Global Astronomy Month calendar. And that is right here. You can see it. It's on our website. And your event will be listed uh, in this section. You have access to all kinds of uh, branding, uh, Global Astronomy Month graphics and things. And there's a lot of different things happening during uh um, this this bra uh, month, I mean, you'll see we had, for instance, this morning a uh, an amazing um, uh, broadcast with Dr. Cyan Proctor, a SpaceX astronaut uh, who's also an artist, a poet, and uh, also an avid amateur astronomer who's just beginning her journey of learning about the night sky. And uh, we've been talking about Mars and Saturn in conjunction. That's an amazing observing event. Guys, don't miss that. That's at dawn. Uh, wherever you are around the world looking towards the east, you get to see these two beautiful planets, Mars and Saturn, converge on Monday morning, April 4th and 5th. They'll be super close. It's a great event. Any, it's open to just the naked eye or telescope or binoculars, whatever you have. You get to enjoy this conjunction, this encounter. And I have to tell you, it's just a, a preview of the main event at the end of the month where the moon will be joining Venus and Jupiter, the two brightest planets, forming a beautiful triangular formation in the morning sky. So mark that down on your calendar. That's part of our Beauty Without Borders photo campaign. You can find out about all of this stuff on our calendar. You can see there we have our guest speaker for today. You've got one later this week, our national coordinator out of Hong Kong, talking about astronomical education, uh, cultural connections to astronomy from folks in the Philippines will be contributing. We've got uh, talking about inclusion and accessibility uh, uh, talks as well, how to get young girls more in engaged in outreach, astronomy outreach, learning from experts' techniques uh, from folks at our partners at, uh, at the Astronomical, Astronomical Society of the Pacific will be joining us. Uh, also, uh, accessibility in terms of those that are visually impaired. We've got a special lecture about that. New uh, amazing uh, digital tools available to really, again, open the doors to the night sky like never before. Of course, we've got a Globe at Night citizen science project. We've got a special speaker, the coordinator, Connie Walker, joining us for a special lecture on how to, how to conduct your own citizen science project, being involved in Globe at Night. And we also have, of course, International Dark Sky Week, celebrating the shared heritage of dark skies and and being able to battle light pollution and how you can get involved in that. That's all week long and end of April. And of course, our Beauty Without Borders campaign, do check that out. We're running that with our partners at Celestron and also at timeanddate.com. Some wonderful things and local events too. We want to hear if you're a local event, uh, like here you can see on, our, on the screen right now, Facebook Live Dark Sky Camp from Romania. You're going to get a sneak peek, a live view uh, out in the 
the countryside of Romania uh, of an actual astronomy camp uh, with kids uh, go uh, happening and you'll be there getting a sneak peek over the shoulder of some of the amateur astronomers of what's happening live in Romania. So if you've got other, other wonderful, either a talk or an actual star party, we want to see that on the calendar and we can showcase it to the world. Uh, so lots of really neat stuff. And let's not forget one last thing um, is the, um, there is going to be, of course, a partial solar eclipse in South America. We'll have a live stream from Argentina showcasing live that uh, beautiful solar disappearing act as the moon chomps big bites out of the disk of the sun uh, on April 30th. So you can stay tuned to that. And we want to have uh, folks send in their photographs too. We've got a live blog with our partner DaytonTime.com uh, showcasing everything that you guys are doing all over the world. Astronomy is really truly for everyone as is our night sky and the cosmos in general. So lots of really neat stuff in the works. Um, so do stay tuned for that. And if you wanna get more information, where do you go? You go to very easy, the, the, the calendar is at gam.awb.org. So that's G-A-M slash A-W-B dot O-R-G. It's as simple as that. Log on there, it'll take you right to that calendar. You can add your event, join A-W-B, it's free, uh, and be part of the world community of astronomy. And we all do good using astronomy. The power of the night sky is very, very impressive indeed. So, without further ado, why we're here today is our first big kickoff uh, Facebook Live of Global Astronomy Month of 2022, and we have our special guest today, who is Mark Westmoquette, and he is, I like to say he's the mindful stargazer. This is an incredible individual who's really made this very deep connection of, I think, that we all have as humans in our DNA of exploration, of being at one with the universe, our striving of getting inner peace. When we look up at the night sky, we all have that. We all get a little bit, when we see all those beautiful stars, we start having those peaceful inner feelings. And there's no time better than now with all the strife in the world of, of, of really we're striving to have that with the pandemic and all. This is the time to really get in contact uh, and feel that that interconnection with the universe above us. And uh, Mark is really an ind uh, amazing individual. I mean, here's, a, here's his latest book, The Mindful Universe, uh, fantastic book. Uh, and Mark is a little background on Mark. He's an astronomer and was a scientist researching astronomy at the European Southern Observatory in Munich um, at London. And he is uh, um, also on, um, uh, a Zen monk uh, and pilgrimage walker. I want to hear more about that, Mark. I, uh, that sounds really <laughs> impressive. And Mark regularly teaches courses and workshops in mindfulness, meditation, and yoga. And he's also an author of uh, other uh, books, Mindful Thoughts for Stargazers. I've read that one. Fantastic. It's a little pocket guide. I have it by my bedside. Highly recommend it. And uh, another, and also stars. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking more about that. So without further ado, uh, Mark, are you on there? There you go. Hey, Mark. Hey, hello, hello. Hey, so glad you could join us today. Uh, you know, you've you've been a busy guy here. I've noticed uh, lots of things going on, and uh, the pandemic hasn't slowed you down one bit. It seems. Mm, so actually, it turns out we were living on this little island for a couple of years, and we kind of missed the pandemic altogether. It was a great place for living. The, the, there was no COVID on the island where we were, so you know, just kind of full steam ahead, really. Sounds like paradise. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. So, uh, Mark, uh, just maybe a little bit of your journey. I mean, I uh, I was just reading, of course, your biography on the on the back of your book here. Uh, mm. You're yeah. actually a scientist, a bona fide ast astronomer, astrophysicist. Astrophys yeah. So I did a degree in astrophysics um, here in London, uh, UCL, and um, and then I ended up sort of carrying on. Uh, got really really enjoyed the research side of things. So I ended up doing a PhD 
and then I ended up doing a postdoc and then another postdoc and then and as you said, I was out in the um, in Munich, in Germany, working for the European Southern Observatory. Yeah, so I did about ten years of academic research in the end. Mm. Wow! And how did uh, how did the mindfulness come in, or was that always there? Mm. So um, I suppose we need to go way back um, in order to sort of understand how that played in, really. Um, uh, I had a, a, a few things happen in my childhood uh, and sort of a, a fairly major trauma, I suppose, in my early teens in my family. And um, I know pe people react to major traumas in life in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and my particular way, my tendency, my way of dealing with it was basically to sort of um, to, to distance myself from any kind of feeling and just to sort of cut everything off. You know, and I... I, I in a sense, it was quite successful at the time. It allowed me to deal with, um, you know, all the difficulty and uh, pain and things like that. Um, but it had consequences, right? So as life goes on, that, that that kind of way of being is not not so helpful for you know relationships and things. Um, so um, as it got, as I got, as I was doing school, as I was doing you know studying and things, I, I I found that I was very interested in science and particularly physics. And so when it came to deciding what to do at university, I, um, I, I kind of got, yeah, got, I suppose, interested in studying astronomy and astrophysics. I, I do remember um, in the maybe a couple of summers before I went to university, there was a total eclipse which passed through the UK. I wasn't in the total, like, full eclipse. I was just, maybe it was about 90% where I lived. But I had a small telescope, and I remember like looking and observing the clips and, and really feeling like that I was like, wow, this is really exciting. Uh, so I, 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 suppose I still think that, that astronomy is the coolest science, you know? <laughs> so I ended up, I decided to go to university and, uh, you know, studying physics was something you can do without any kind of emotions. And so, you know, me and where I was, I was very, I very distant myself, kind of separated from any kind of fe feeling, and that linear, logical, reasoning way of being um, really connect fitted, I suppose, with where I was. Um, yeah. So then I, you know, as I say, I went through, did my degree, and did a PhD, and then um, um, I start the consequences of that tendency of mine to really hold people at arm's length and not get involved in any kind of relationship. Um, you know, started to become a real problem. And then I I went and did some psychotherapy. And at the same time, I also started to practice yoga. I got into meditating and that really opened things up. Um, and it allowed me to start to see some of the consequences of my ways of being. And it allowed me to start to um, change the way I related to people and change the way I felt about myself. And, um, and, yeah, so I guess they kind of went along in parallel for some years before I managed to start to bring them together a bit. And you have, mm -hmm. you've done it in such an elegant way of bringing the two worlds together. And they are really intertwined, aren't they? The two, you know, are very much uh, codependent almost. Uh, you know, I, I well, I, I, for many years, I couldn't see the connection at all. When, when I... Um, I, after I'd done about yeah ten years of research, it, it, it started to dawn on me that maybe the academic lifestyle wasn't quite where I wanted to be, and and um, I made the shift out and I started to teach yoga and meditation and things. Um, I the astronomy kind of faded, I suppose, into the background, in, into the <laughs> into the rearview mirror, and I just thought, no, I need to focus on yoga. You know, I need to focus on sort of sorting myself out, really. Um, uh, and then people were saying to me, you need to find a way of connecting those two. I just, it just wasn't obvious for a long while. But, but now that you, you know, from, from, you know, re reading the books and, and talking, now it's very obvious. So <laughs> you're right. They are very intertwined, but I just couldn't see it for a long time. Well, we definitely want to hear some more. I know you've got a uh, uh, presentation set up. Uh, before you begin, I just want to say a <laughs> shout out to folks out there. We've got uh, 
We've got uh, folks joining us from India, uh, Argentina, Australia. Uh, we've got them all over the place. It's just fantastic seeing everyone around the world joining us. And if you have a question for Mark, please do put it into the comment section and we'll try to get to it after uh, Mark's presentation. Yeah, so sure. Mark, you're okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so Mark, why don't you take it away? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's great, yeah. So unfortunately, for some reason, I can't quite make it play the presentation properly. So, you know, excuse me, I've got it displayed like this in my PowerPoint. Um, Hmm. So I'd like to start with just a little slide from um, back when I was in astronomy. Um, this was in 2008. This was just after I finished my PhD and I managed to get, um, I, I don't know if, if you know anything about professional astronomy, um, but uh, astronomers tend to fall into two strands, two, two groups. So there's the astronomers that go out and use telescopes and these the astronomers that are more kind of theoretical, like um, modeling things on computers and trying to understand what the observations mean. Anyway, so I was down the, the observational route and um, most of your time as a professional astronomer is, is taken up by writing proposals for getting time on telescopes. So you typically do a whole raft of them and get one or, or none is most of the time anyway so here we are i got a couple of nights observing time with a, a japanese colleague of mine on the a subaru telescope on mauna kea in hawaii so um this this was just before christmas i was out my first time to hawaii and the first time up to the summit of mauna kea and um you know you sort of like it's like the mythical place you know that the mauna kea on hawaii is like the center of astronomy world really you've got some of the biggest telescopes in the world, some of the best nights, clear nights and, and observing time. So um, it was kind of really like amazing for me to be able to go out that first time. So you drive up the um, towards the summit, you know, as it gets towards the end of the day and the light's starting to fade, you know, here this, I, I can't remember if this was the morning or the, the evening, but it's something like this, you know, beautiful crystal blue skies, that the evening is coming along and you look up and you see all these gazillions of stars and you think this is appearing, appearing into the twilight. You think this is going to be a, a really great night. And then you disappear into the control room. So the control room looks a little bit like this, like, you know, banks of computers and um, uh, displays and, you know, all that kind of stuff, wiring and, and, and then weird kind of alarms that go off at random times. So this was my time, I disappeared into the control room and I sat down and opened my laptop and, and really kind of spent the entire night just completely absorbed in what we were doing, what we were observing, get, collecting the data, checking it was okay, all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, all the way through the night, whatever it was, six in the morning, you're a bit bleary eyed, kind of stumble back outside again and it's dawn, you know, and you see the sun starting to rise up. I had not been outside to look at the stars once. And it took me a long time to realize that's what had happened. You know, here I am as an astronomer. I got into astronomy because I was really kind of passionate about, you know, looking at the stars and what they had to say and what we could find out from them. And I'd gone to this mecca of astronomy to Hawaii and I had not looked up at the night sky once. <clears throat> <coughs> and now I think it's a real travesty, you know, really sad, sad that, that I had got that to that point. And, um, you know, I was just so involved in the science. Um, so what tends to happen um, in, in my experience of a scientific education is, um, you know, it's all about coming into that very logical, linear, very kind of narrow um, way of being, way of thinking, way of um, uh, 
you know, conducting your research, research, research is all very linear, you know, progression, progressive. So, you, you know, in, in publishing a paper, you have to show what people have done before, why you're doing what you're doing, what you found and the steps all the way through that. It's all about these kind of linear steps. So and of course, me being where I had where I got to, as I described a bit earlier, I had um, developed this way of being which which kind of really fitted that. You know, I had separated myself from all of the emotions, all of the feeling. And I had it's all, almost to the point where I basically buried myself in the furthest reaches of the cosmos to try to escape feeling and try to escape real life, you know, for me at that time. And, and it fitted, it fitted like a hand in a glove, you know, how I was doing like this linear, progressive, very reasoned uh, research. And I had forgotten the magic of the night sky. And actually this went on, on a, quite a long time. Uh, a couple of years later, I ended up going to, um, so I was working at ESO, European Southern Observatory, and I ended up having a, a trip out to Chile. So this is me in front of the, the VLT telescopes in the Atacama. Um, and this one, I, this one I, I remember, I did actually manage to get out in the night. So um, I remember being in the, in the control room and uh, needing the loo, and it just so happens the toilet was quite close to the front door of the of the building. And I remember coming out of the toilet and going, okay, well, I'll just nip outside. And you go outside, it's like, wow, this is a, a wow. And you think, gosh, I better get back in. <laughs> I've got work to do, you know, I'm, 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 I've got stuff to do. So, I, you know, you go back in. <clears throat> hmm. So just a little bit about the kinds of things that I was uh, looking at personally as a, as a research astronomer. So I was really interested in the, um, the formation of star clusters and particularly how the energy that comes off a star, a newly born star, affects all the gas that's around it. OK, so here this is on the left. We've got a picture of a very young star cluster. So this might be about three million years old. So in the in the grand scheme of things, this is a very, very young star cluster. A star typically takes maybe a, a million or two years to form. So we're just seeing it emerging from the gas cloud that it was formed from. And all of the energy from the stars is kind of evaporating all the remaining gas. So it's lit up, looks very beautiful and um, uh, what is it that transforms a very young star cluster like this on the left to on the right, we've got a globular cluster, M30. So a globular cluster typically is about 10 billion years old, one of the oldest structures, you know, in our galaxy. And it's formed of, well, I mean, countless numbers of stars. They're all gravitationally bound and it's blown up. There's no longer any gas left over. So, so how does a young star cluster evolve into an old star cluster uh, and how what's the feedback mechanisms? That was what I was sort of primarily interested in. So, I mean, this is one of my fa most favorite images in all of um, all of the Hubble archive. This is of the star, this is um, <clears throat> 3603, is it right? Thir NGC 3603. So this is a, um, is that right? Gosh, it's been so long since I've been in astronomy. Anyway, it's a, it's a very young star cluster. And we're looking at the detail, you know, of how the energy comes off these stars <clears throat> and lights up. And it, it's basically eroding, eroding the gas around it to produce these lovely finger like protrusions that sort of stick out. <coughs> so, you know, I, I was observing the the interface between the stars and the gas and trying to understand how the gases were um, evolving with time. Yeah. Mm. So um, let's see. So I got to this point in my in my career as an astronomer, and I had started to realise what um, what would, what are the consequences of my way of being had been had been. You know, um, I'd disappeared. I'd escaped to the furthest reaches of the cosmos. I buried myself in in uh, 
um, all this study, you know, it's very linear, very logical, very emotionless. And suddenly I sort of, you know, I, was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really able to form deep friendships. I certainly wasn't really getting very far with the romantic relationships. And my relationships with my family were quite sort of strained. Um, I remember being at home one, one Easter, I think it was an Easter holiday, and I must have said something really, really horrible to my sister, uh, you know. Um, and my mum said to me, Mark, you know, you really need to get to you need to sort yourself out. You need to go and get some therapy or something like that. So, you know, it was tough medicine to hear. I mean, when anyone tells you that kind of thing, it's really tough to hear it. But um, I went back to university. I went to the university you know, counselling service, and they put me in touch with the therapist, and I started to work with him a bit. As I, as I mentioned earlier, also started to um, meditate. So, I, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about meditation, but um, the, the kind of practice, I was doing mindfulness meditation, and the main point of that is to bring your attention to the present moment, and not judge it to be good or bad, not try to do anything about it, not try to manipulate it. So it gave me the space to be able to allow some of this stuff that I've been basically sort of suppressing or pushing down um, to kind of like bubble up, but bubble up in such a way that I wasn't really needing to do anything with it. And it certainly wasn't a good thing or a bad thing. So it's like the space plus all the, the psychotherapy and kind of like backwards and forwards and, and un unraveling stuff and looking at it like that. And then having the space, the space for it to sort of bubble around. Um, I realized that this very logical reasoned way of being had made me into a person which was like so imbalanced. I had logic on one side and the, the kind of more intuitive more like holistic maybe more in touch more embodied way of being was like right down here in fact actually i think in in scientific education it's like it's like pushed down you know um uh, even though even though in history of science there's been a number of very famous examples where people have made those kind of intuitive leaps you know einstein was one of those people just intuitive leaps sudden um, realizations um, but but nevertheless in education you know that's kind of like not really talked about it's not really it's not really um, accepted as a valid way of doing science so I ended up in this kind of very imbalanced way of being and my um, astronomy education sorry excuse me my my um, my meditation and my psychotherapy was showing me this other way of being. You know, I was doing yoga, I was meditating, and it was so embodied, you didn't have to work anything out. There was none of that. It was just like right here, right now, and it allowed this stuff to come up. <clears throat> so I did something quite extreme, and I, I wonder perhaps whether I, you know, not everyone needs to do this kind of stuff if they find themselves in that kind of situation. But anyway, I decided to quit astronomy. I thought I need to really sort out like this balance a bit. So I, I ended up leaving Munich, coming back to London. Um, I had been teaching yoga a little bit at that point. So I decided, let's take up teaching yoga. Let's take up teaching mindfulness and, and see where that takes me. <coughs> so um, I've got a little cough left over. I had COVID last week. So I apologize, a bit of a cough. <coughs> um. So as I mentioned at the beginning, like astronomy kind of fade into distance. I, I knew that when I left research astronomy, then I would not really be able to go back. Uh, once you had a few years out, it's really, really difficult to get back into research. So I knew I'd left that behind and I, I was focusing on my you know, practice and things like that. Um, and then I got contacted by a publisher um, I said I, I kind of we, we read your website a bit and uh, I had a little blog which I you know was writing a few bits I read read your blog and we we thought maybe you'd be the right person to write a book we've got a series of, of books called mindful thoughts 
And we want to do mindful thoughts for stargazers. Um, you know, would you be interested to write that book? So, uh, you know, as with these things, you, you get an email and you sort of have to, you think it's spam. This is clearly spam, you know. Um, so I, I Googled the publishing company. It all seemed, you know, above board and um, okay. So I, I wrote back. I said, yeah, okay, I'll give this a go. And and so then this this first book was born. Um, uh, Andrew mentioned it a bit earlier. So Mindful Thoughts for Stargazers, a little book. And so we've got about 20 or so contemplations in there about the, um, the, the coming together of mindfulness and um, and stargazing. So let me give you an example of, of the um, the connection. So chapter one uh, in this book talks about how every single view on our planet since the beginning of humanity has changed. So humans have been on this planet for maybe, I don't know, is it 200,000 years, something like that? Homo sapiens, a little bit less maybe. And on that, in that time, every single view has changed. There's been volcanoes, there's been sea levels rising and falling, there's been glaciers, ice ages, all that kind of stuff. The only thing that stayed the same over all that time is the night sky. So 200,000 years is not enough time for the stars to have moved significantly to make any difference to the constellations. Actually, every single human that has ever looked up at the night sky has seen the same pattern of stars. Okay, They may have divided them differently and come up with different stories, but the shape of the stars and the patterns has been the same. So to me, that feels deeply connecting. You know, we look up on a dark night and we see exactly the same as every human has ever seen that's ever been on this planet. So I, I would encourage you the next time it's dark to, to just look up and just think, wow, I am looking at the same thing as every human. I mean, obviously there's different, if, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you're going to see different stars, but all the humans that have ever lived in the Southern Hemisphere have seen names, seen those same stars. Mm. So um, I wonder if perhaps, well, I, I, it went on, right? They asked me, could I do another book? And um, uh, Andrew very kindly um, flashed that one up at the beginning as well. So the Mindful Universe expands it a little bit. And we've got some guided meditations in there. Also some more science and a little bit more about my own journey. So. Um, I perhaps wonder whether you'd be interested if to do a little meditation practice, a mindful stargazing meditation uh, that we can do on together. <clears throat> now, you don't need to have done any meditation before, and it's going to be fairly short, so you know, no need to worry. <coughs> first things first is to make sure you're sitting comfortably. OK, so uh, think about mindfulness. We put a lot of attention on the body posture. So we want to just sit comfortably, aligned, middle, you know, sitting up if you can. Just resting your hands down and you may want to just close your eyes. You may just keep your eyes a little bit open. That's also fine. Just, just kind of looking down, closing the eyes if you want. So we're going to bring the attention into the body. So you think of stargazing about looking up into the, you know, into the dark night sky, but we can do stargazing in a very different way. You know, we don't need the night time. We can kind of connect with the universe in a, in a different way. It's what we're going to do now. So just dropping the attention into your body. First of all, just notice your head, face, your shoulders, your back, your chest, your belly, your arms, your hands, your legs, your feet. So we're just present in the body. And at any point, if your mind wanders off and we start thinking about something else, that's absolutely normal. All we do is just guide it back, come back, come back to your body. 
Now the first area that we're going to focus on is your mouth. So I'd like you to just move your tongue around inside your mouth and see if you can get a sense of the saliva in your mouth. So just moving your tongue a bit tends to generate a bit of saliva. Just getting a sense of that watery liquid. Now saliva is mostly water. In fact, the body in general is about three quarters made of water. And we know that water is made of one oxygen atom by bound to two hydrogen atoms. We call it H2O. Now all the hydrogen in all of the water in your whole body, including in your mouth that you can feel with your tongue, all that hydrogen was actually created in the Big Bang. So the universe started 13 and a half billion years ago, an extremely unfathomably long time ago. It started with the whole universe in one little tiny dot, extremely hot, everything was just pure energy. And as the universe expanded, it cooled. And as things cool, then small particles could solidify out of this energy. So we first get quarks, and then we get quarks binding together to create protons and neutrons. We also get electrons. The universe expanded and cooled a little bit more, and suddenly electrons and protons bind together. And an electron and a proton together is hydrogen. It's the simplest atom. So in just that first second after the Big Bang, the universe created vast amounts of hydrogen. And that hydrogen has been floating about in space ever since. It's been into stars, out of stars, in galaxies, out of galaxies. <clears throat> and then 13 and a half billion years later, it's here on this planet Earth, and finds its way into your body that you can feel with your tongue as you just move it around inside your mouth. I find that just amazing. So the next thing I'd like you to notice is your skin. So you may be able to just touch your skin with your fingers or you might be able to just feel your clothes on your skin, some way of getting a sense of your skin. Now skin is made of proteins and proteins are made of amino acids and amino acids are made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Now the universe, after the Big Bang, some millions of years later, the first stars formed. Stars are big balls of hydrogen, that converting hydrogen into helium, we call it the nuclear fusion reaction. Hydrogen is converted into helium, gets compressed together and re releases a lot of energy. But in doing so, it produces small amounts, it's like a byproduct, small amounts of heavier elements. So from hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So those stars would have lived their lives and then at the end of their life, typically they just kind of pulsate and they throw off material at the end, like our sun will, creates a planetary nebula. <coughs> and that material will dissipate into space containing small amounts of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. That would have floated around in space and finally made its way into our solar system, into our planet, and just right now, into your skin. So your skin is literally made of stuff that was once made inside a star. Now some stars are small and they produce small amounts of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, that kind of thing. Some stars explode in a supernova. If they're big enough, they will explode in a giant explosion and there's enough energy in a supernova to produce some of those heavier elements. Heavier elements that we need in our body for certain things. So like for example, digestion, we need small amounts of copper, potassium. Our blood needs things like iron. 
and all of those elements, heavier elements, were produced inside supernovae, blasted out into space, floated about a bit, and got incorporated in our solar system and just into your body right now. So you're, I mean, we kind of know this, right? You know, it's one of those almost cliches in astronomy these days, we're made of star stuff, but actually to feel it, okay? Your body, your skin, your saliva, parts of your digestive system, parts of your blood are made of stuff that was once inside a star. We are made of the universe. We are creatures of the universe. Great. So maybe just take a deeper breath. <sighs> Lovely. And then let your eyes lift and open. Mm. So we can connect with the universe in lots of different ways. We can do it like this, like daytime. You don't need the night, you know, night sky. We can just kind of realize how we are in, we're deeply in the universe. But I would also encourage you next time you're outside in the dark night sky, <clears throat> it's very easy to get caught up in the technology, you know, around astronomy. So we've got our telescopes, apps, you know, we've got the um, various camera equipment, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and it's all great. But sometimes it can be a little bit like me on Mauna Kea, you know, all those years back. Um, we're spending the entire evening looking at our computer screen, pressing all the buttons and trying to work out where we are with the app. that we forget to look up and just really marvel at the beautiful night sky. <coughs> <coughs> so I'd suggest next time you're out and it's dark, just put all the tech aside, put down your phone, put all the maps down and just for a little while, look up, you know. You don't need to move your eyes around, just let your eyes fix on one point, but just become aware of the whole periphery of your vision. Look and listen. So what does it sound like? What kind of sounds are you hearing? How is it to be in this moment of right here? with the night sky. And it can be so beautiful, so beautiful. The occasional maybe aeroplane, satellite, shooting star, twinkling, the different colors of the stars. And then it's the feeling also of knowing that here we are human and we're sharing this view with every other human on the planet at this very moment. You know, every human at nighttime can look up and see the same pattern of stars. And of course, as I said, every human back in time has also seen those stars, seen those stars. So it's a it's a really magical moment of where we can find that awe, you know. And these days people know that finding awe, like Wow, that is amazing. It's actually really, really good for our mental health. It makes us feel part of something bigger, you know, allows us to sort of calm down out of that stress mode and into, into our body, you know, into this feeling of being a human. And then maybe later you want to pick up your cameras and your telescope and think that's fine. So, um, uh, I wonder, there's, there's another fantastic um, example of a mindful stargazing exercise that you can do at home that also doesn't need the night sky. And that's just kind of like bringing up a Hubble picture and just spending a couple of moments looking at it and just kind of like, again, it's like that wow factor. So I'm just going to bring one up right now that I find amazing. You can imagine you're in an art gallery and you just wander down the corridor and you turn and you see this piece of art. You don't know what it is. I mean, you may have you may have a sense of what this is. Um, but just for now, we can put that to the side and just look at it. Looking at it like you're looking at a piece of art, you know, before you read the label, before you know what it is, it's like, okay, wow. And you just look, look. And the colours and the shapes. 
I mean, some people have said to me, this looks like a wave crashing on a beach. Some people say it looks a little bit like the coming together of two, like an embrace, you know, between two beings. And we, do, we don't need to know what it is. We don't need to know any of the science to appreciate how amazingly beautiful this is. And that the universe is actually full of things like this that are just so beautiful. And then if we add a bit of knowledge and say this is two galaxies colliding and all the red stuff is young stars and all the blue stuff is, is kind of like um, older stars, then it's like, oh my God, so many stars. And it's all in this like crash, you know, together. And I think just a little bit of science can sometimes increase that awe factor. And it's like, wow. Then if I tell you this is a couple of million light years away and the light has been traveling through space for a few million years to reach us. Yeah, that's like, wow, yeah. So you can do this with any, any beautiful you know, astronomy picture. Before you know what it is, just spend a little moment absorbing how beautiful it is, marveling. So thank you so much for, you know, coming along on this little journey. Um, I've got quite a few things, you know, if you're interested and you want to sort of explore this a little bit more, then, you know, I mentioned the books, go look them up. Books are on Amazon, you know, all the usual places. Um, I've got a couple of things. I've been trying to do a little bit of um, some workshops and some retreat evenings and some stuff around in the UK where I'm based in London. Um, you know, London's not a great place for doing stargazing, but we don't need it to be perfectly clear in order to be able to connect and find our, our um, um, way in the universe. I've got a couple of things coming up. If you're interested and you're around in Europe, um, later this summer, I'm gonna be doing a, a yoga and mindful stargazing retreat in the Loire Valley in France <coughs> in August. And then we're gonna be out in um, in Portugal in um, um Oh, that's a mistake there, I'm sure. It's 25th to 30th of July, and then the 7th to 13th of August. We're going to be out in Portugal. My mistake, I'm sorry about that. Uh, to you know, but uh, kind of like connecting with nature, really, forest bathing and mindful stargazing and a little bit of movement practice. Yeah, so if you're around in Europe and you're interested in that, come find me out, come find me. Um, yeah, so, I mean, have there been, I wonder if there are any questions that are coming up um, or if there's any questions arisen from all of that. <laughs> hey Mark, that's wonderful. I've uh, posted here your website address so folks can can check things out cool. if they are uh, interested in finding out more information about your books and your your workshops that you do that are ongoing. Yeah. Um, so check that out. It's in there. It's also in the comment section. It's on the screen. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, pop them in uh, and uh, we can uh, ask Mark. And, uh, you know, I'll throw things off here uh, off the bat. You know, Mark, you know, th this is a journey, obviously, that, that, that you've taken to get to where you are. Um, it sounds to me, I mean, I, I have to profess, I do a little bit of my, uh, you know, mindfulness i try to do it every day uh incorporate it take some time out very light kind of uh mindfulness mm. but mm. it serves me i've no i think it sounds like it is a lifelong journey right and it's not mm. necessarily a destination that you have to reach is this true absolutely absolutely yeah 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 so um most of what we do in life, in fact, probably 99% of what we do in life is all about sort of achieving something. You know, we study, we we do our work um, and we achieve, you know, we uh, we we uh, we gather our achievements like they're sort of prizes. Um, but actually, mindfulness is completely in different. You know, it's, it comes from a totally different angle. It's not about getting anywhere. In fact, actually, it's about arriving now. 
You know, we're, we're constantly sort of reaching. I want to be somewhere else. You know, I don't really like right now or I really like right now and I don't want to, this to change, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, we end up sort of grasping all around the place, wanting things to be different. Actually, mindfulness is about coming into now, being right now and, and appreciating how now is actually really very lovely and beautiful. So, for example, um, you go outside, you know, you've been all, all week, you've been looking forward to the conjunction that you're talking about of Mars and, and Saturn. Right. So we're we're, um, we're really looking forward to it. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And uh, forecast looks great. You go outside and it's cloudy. You feel disappointed, you know, you feel like, but it's also just the way it is, you know, so we can go outside and instead of being like, oh God, you know, it can be like, okay, well, I'm just gonna immerse myself in this cloudy morning or, or, or evening and, um, you know, look up at the clouds and see, oh, the clouds are actually really quite beautiful. And I can hear all these sounds of nature and I'm kind of right here and I'm, I'm not, not wanting anything anymore. I'm just like right here and enjoying this. So that's that's where mindfulness can can really take us out of that kind of like stressful grasping <coughs> um, mindset and bring us into right here now. Yeah, mm. you know, and I always try to say to myself, mm. yeah, and, you know, being an amateur astronomer back here, I said, uh, yeah, definitely we're all battling the clouds, right? As a, as a sky watcher, mm. you know, looking for the next celestial event. Oh, geez, there's another... And I feel for you because I know I'm in Montreal, Canada, and we have probably 60% of our uh, of our skies are cloudy at the time. So it's uh, you know it's really something. It's it's uh, it's quite exhilarating when we do get the clear skies. But you know I say to myself, the sun and the stars and the moon are still shining above the clouds. They're there. And I find that that yeah. is an uplifting thought to say they're there. They're not yeah. gone, it's, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And above our heads, you know, we've got about 100 kilometers in atmosphere. And actually of that, the clouds are probably like, I don't know, a few hundred meters. So actually, it's only a very thin layer that's obscuring what we can see beyond. Yeah. Now, I've got here, uh, I think, our mutual friend of ours, Neil Sanders, uh, hi, saying hi, Mark. Thank you for an excellent talk. I'd like to ask, where has been one of your favorite places to stargaze? Hmm, lovely question. Yeah. So, um, uh, about two and a half years ago, we got the opportunity to go out for two years to this little island. Um, it's called Saint Helena. It's a British overseas island and it's down in the South Atlantic. And if you know anything about Napoleonic history, it's where Napoleon was exiled and died. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my wife had a job. We went out for two years and we got back last May. So there was no COVID on the island at all. So we managed to escape the, uh, the pandemic uh, completely while we we're out there. But um, it, it absolutely opened my eyes. And so at that point, I've been kind of connecting a little bit with stargazing and mindfulness. And I'd, you know, I'd written um, that first book. Um, and of course, but London here, the stars are, you know, occasionally you see one or two. Um, but going out onto St. Helena, St. Helena is this tiny island. There's very, almost no light pollution. And when it was clear, it was just so, so, so dark. And, um, and being able to walk out of the back door into the back garden and see this, this beautiful view of the Milky Way and all that stuff. And it, it just it just rekindled for me that sense of, of magic, you know, of what the, the sky had to offer and just being able to look up and, and enjoy, you know, and, and it's like um, night after night being able to do that really, really did something to me. And, and now I'm, yeah, it's very, very special to be able to go to a place where it's dark down to the horizon and you see all those stars, very, very special. Yeah, so that has been the real favorite place for me. And it, thinking back, uh, your time of looking up at the sky, was there any particular object type that kind of really sets off that wonder and awe that in, in you? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
when you get to see something outside of our, I mean, the Milky Way is beautiful. Milky Way, I, I'm, you know, it's absolutely spectacular. But when you can see something outside of the Milky Way, that really, really blows my mind. You know, in the Southern Hemisphere, we can see the Magellanic Clouds. And, um, and to know that that's just outside, they're another galaxy, you know, all those, the cloud is full of stars. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, if you manage to catch, you know, a nice dark night and see the Andromeda Galaxy, very, very faint little smudge, but you see it, it's two million light years away. And so light has been traveling from that galaxy since before humanity, you know, since like, I don't know what happened two million years ago, uh, way, way back into the depths of time and light's been traveling. So that, that, that to me completely like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, word, no words at that point, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I find definitely the concept of, you know, the, uh, I do a lot of outreach too with uh, with folks, and I I think one of the big connections that I get people buying into this you know stargazing and really getting hooked on it is the idea that we do time travel when we look up at the sky. Mm -hmm. Everything is so distant uh, is that it takes time for the light to to reach us. Those photons of light just travel such enormous distances i mean even the sun right it takes eight and a half minutes for the light from mm. the sun the, even i mean uh, what is it the moon is 1.2 light seconds away so the reflected mm. sunlight of that and then you're talking about the stars the average star distance out there that we see with the naked eye is about uh, a, a human lifetime about 75 mm. 80 light years right the average star that we can see with the naked eye in a night sky typical night sky so that whole time that you're literally looking back in time. And then, you know, I think with our modern age technology of, you know, of Hubble and all its other cousin tele telescopes on the ground and in space, we've pushed that back even farther to billions of light years. You know, the mm. web, you know, we, we see, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking the web, James Webb's telescope, it's promising mm. to reach back to, what, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang that we're going to see light mm. from that? It's inc it's, that is inc just awe-inspiring, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was working in as a professional astronomer, um, what I realized, what astronomers do is they come up with different units to make things comprehensible, right? So um, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, and then at the edge of, as soon as you get up to like a few, um, you know, planets distance away, then the number of kilometers is is inconceivable. So you, you start talking about AU, right? The distance, Earth to Sun distance. And you measure like Mars and Jupiter and Saturn is a certain number of AU. Then you get outside of the solar system and then the numbers become silly again. You go all the way up to the next star. And then you talk about light years, right? Or And then astronomers come up with a different, you know, they talk about parsecs. So parsecs allows people to talk in small numbers. So it's like, okay, well, I'm studying this galaxy. It's like five parsecs away, you know, or, or, or whatever it is, 5,000 parsecs away. And then you start to, and so it just makes it more comprehensible. I used to think that if, if, if I stopped on a day-to-day -day basis and actually kind of thought about what I was doing, sitting in front of my computer, looking at this galaxy as 12 million light years away, and it's, you know, it would just blow my mind every day. <laughs> So, so you sort of, you have to, it becomes sort of, um, you become numb to it, I suppose, uh, which is kind of sad. So it's, it's really important, as you say, to just consider, you know, what it is this, just like, wow. Yeah. It's humbling too, isn't it? You know, and that's one thing that, um, you know, at Astronomers Without Borders too, we, you know, it speaks to us, you know, that the idea that it's a shared heritage, this, all these you know, natural wonders that are up there. It is our shared heritage. We're on the spaceship Earth floating through the universe, yeah. you know, all together. Um, and, you know, we see all these uh, shared wonders. It is really humbling. And I think what's also the effect of all of this in terms of mindful stargazing too, if people do practice it even for just a few moments a day, other than humbling, it also kind of gives yes inner peace but um there's also this effect of uh that you 
want to give it on to other people. You want to share that, Sh sharing mm. that wonder. As it, I know for myself, I have my two children, my two daughters, 12 and 14. I want to bring them out when I see something wondrous in the sky, be it a satellite even or, or, or the crescent moon, bring them out and, and share that wonder. And, and I've read even in scientific papers that people do, uh, do want to do good to others. It's uh, empathy. Mm -hmm. It builds that empath empathy in people. So it's a very big, it's very powerful, and it goes even beyond, I think, just the singular person who's being affected. That effect can reverberate much larger. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. That's right, yeah, yeah. So I think um, uh, I, I get the sense that people who are just kind of getting into this stuff um, find there's, there's a kind of learning curve. If I want to take my kids outside and do and look at the stars, they're going to ask me all sorts of awkward questions that I don't really remember. I don't remember my school physics, you know, in, in yeah. enough. So I get a bit worried that I'm not going to be able to answer their questions. So I think this can be a real block, but in no sense does it need to be. We go out there and we wonder together, you know. I, the kid asks, you know, what is that? And you're like, I don't know. That's amazing. Let's Google it later. You know, yeah. all the kids like, wow, that, that's amazing. And it's just like that shared experience of being together, looking, looking at nature. It's this, this part of nature. Mm. Exactly. I think stargazing, you know, looking at the sky um, with family and friends, with children, it's a, it's a bonding uh, activity too, isn't mm -hmm. it? And it is, like you said, I, you know, there's no need to be ashamed if you, as a parent, you can't answer the question. You know, you go, well, let's find out together. That's a great question. Let's go and investigate. And it's a and it's something that's a share. It's a shared moment, a learning moment, I think, for 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 both parties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Hey, we've got another question here from Hassan Chemist. So may I ask a question? Is the light of the stars coming from a past time? I mean, is it really we, we're seeing the past time of the stars in our present time? Ah, I can see mm. the minds trying to bend around, <laughs> around this concept. That's right. So, so basically, yes is the answer. Yes, we're seeing the light from star. Uh, you know, we, we see a star and it's, let's say it's, as you say, like 100 light years away. So um, that means that at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, Light has been traveling for 100 years through space and then it, it enters through the atmosphere. And it just so happens that at that very moment it comes into your eye, which I find absolutely mind boggling in itself. You know, of all the light rays in the whole universe from this one star goes out spherically, you know, in all directions. Just happens that this one light ray comes through the atmosphere, misses all the clouds and the satellites and all that stuff. And it just goes into your eye at this very moment. So I feel I, I would always feel very it's very kind of like blessed at that point this star has shone at me at this point so yeah 100 years um you know we're seeing further and further and further back in time the more we look out into space there is no way of knowing what that star is like right now we can only know what it was when that light left now that blows my mind that's incredible very humbling <laughs> <laughs> Very humbly. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is very enlightening. I think, uh, you know, it definitely brings a new perspective to sky watching. Uh, um, I think in a much needed time, epoch of human, mm. of humankind right now, we need it more than ever. Um, and uh, I hope our folks in our network, in our community worldwide, those of you that are doing outreach, uh, consider this of mindful stargazing, of connecting with the public and folks that you you do um, outreach with, because I think this is something. It's a it's a wonderful concept, and it's open to anyone, all ages, all education, religion. It does not matter what we again crossing the border, transcending borders. That's what Astronomers Without Borders is about. And I think this yeah. concept, that's why yeah. just it's just fantastic and so much needed. The, Mark, it's a shared humanity, yeah. Yes, exactly. Mark, thank you so much for, for coming by mm -hmm. and sharing these wondrous things with us. Um, and I oh. hope you, you can come back yeah. again uh, 
to, to us uh, at AWB. It Absolutely. really is incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You, Thank so you so much. much. And uh, for those of you that are interested, uh, Mark's book is The Mindful Universe. It's available where all great books are sold on Amazon, of course. Just put in The Mindful Universe and uh, you'll be able to, to, to get that. And of course, um, also is, um, uh, let's not forget, is Mark's website. Let me just put that up here for you guys. There's Mark. So website, it's markwestmaquette.co.uk. And you've got all, he's got all that information about his yoga sessions, his mindfulness sessions that he does. He's got a great YouTube channel too, and Facebook. Uh, all of that information you'll find on Mark's website as well. And so um, let's not forget also, it is Global Astronomy Month, folks. There's a lot more coming your way this coming up week. We've got another amazing astronomy education-based uh, Facebook Live coming up in a few days, I think on April 8th, uh, where I'll be hosting a special guest, our national coordinator from Hong Kong, uh, will be here to share his experiences with astronomy education. And we've got a whole slew of others all month long. You wanna check out what's happening or you wanna register your astronomy event, head on over to our website. It's gam.awb.org. That's G-A-M dash A-W-B dot O-R-G. Gam dash A-W-B dot org is where you want to go and find out everything about uh, Global Astronomy on 13th edition. We are just heading into a month long of amazing activities. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm your host, Andrew Fizekas, the Night Sky Guy, signing out. Wishing everyone clear skies. Bye-bye.